Good morning, International Church of Prague. What comes to mind when you hear the word love? For most of us, we tend to think of romantic love. I'm here along the Venice Canal beneath the Charles Bridge here in Prague, and it's considered to be one of the most romantic places in all of Prague. And indeed, it is a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place to take a walk with your loved one, or perhaps get in a boat and be able to take a cruise down the Venice Canal. Beyond me is the water wheel and the water sprite, and just beyond that is the Lover's Bridge. It's an incredible setting. But romance, as important as it is, isn't love. In our modern culture, few things are more misunderstood than love. Because you see, love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Love is an active and sacrificial choice. Part of the confusion surrounding love is that we use the English word love for so many different things. For instance, I can say, I love my wife, and I dearly, dearly love her. But I can also say that I love French fries. Now, there's a great difference between those two statements. What I mean is I enjoy the flavor, the texture, the crispiness of French fries, or for my British friends, chips. But I certainly don't feel about French fries the way I feel about my wife. What's more important is when I say I love French fries, I'm just saying I enjoy that what they do for me, at least the flavor that it gives me. But it really has nothing to do with love because love is all about a choice. I love my wife and I choose, just as she has chosen, to live our lives in such a way where we serve one another, where we build one another up. I enjoy her company. I love being with her. And I'm deeply thankful for who she is, for what she does, and for the woman that she has become. I enjoy her presence, and her presence stirs my emotions, certainly. But she is much more to me, and our love is far more important than simply something I enjoy. It is a sacrificial commitment that reflects God's love for us. The language of the New Testament is Greek, and it has four different words to describe love. Eros is romantic feelings and often includes sexual desires as well. Storge is a familial love, the love of a parent for a child, for a brother, for a sister, or for a child, for its parent. It's a protective and caring type of love. Phileo is brotherly love or sisterly love, and it means a deep friendship for, one, for another person. Agape, however, is the love of God. It is a self-sacrificing love that commits itself to the good of another, even at great cost. Think about your relationships for a moment. What kind of relationships do you have? And what type of love do those relationships reflect? In our world, there are many different kinds of friendships, of relationships that we have. Right now, especially because of COVID, most of us are experiencing a great number of digital relationships. Well, a digital relationship that's connected by social media or by Zoom or by phone calls and emails, that's important, but they tend to be surface relationships. And we don't allow people to get too close in order to see the real us. Instead, what we often do is present the best view of who we are by choosing the images that we share and the texts that accompany it. A digital relationship in today's world of social media and relating to others through screens has become a chief way for some of us to be able to connect. For many, digital friendships function as a form of self-validation. We are desperately trying to cover up something that feels empty within us. We want people to like us, and there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. And we use digital relationships to try to affirm ourselves, our own worth. But our worth comes from something far different than what we put on a screen. Another type of relationship that most of us have, at least to some degree, is what I would call a benefit relationship. And that simply means, what can you do for me? 
benefit relationships treats others as a means to an end. There is a self-centeredness in the aspect of that relationship when we're looking to get something from someone else. It certainly doesn't reflect the biblical concept of love. Likewise, there are one-dimensional relationships. What, what do we have in common? Because we agree about a certain idea or a certain practice or we have a certain hobby, we are connected together in a relationship. We feel this is a safe place. This is a place where we can have some fun and do some things and our worth will be built up by the time that we spent with the other person. It's quite natural to begin a friendship there with what we have in common. But true relationship, true love grows beyond that. It grows beyond the interests in sports or in politics or career or a hobby. These relationships prioritize the sameness of views, the connectedness that we have, the practices, the beliefs that we have. And when it's something that's outside of that realm, sometimes those relationships can be challenged. But an authentic love relationship is different. It runs the risk of unconditional love. You see, in each of these other relationships, we're doing our best to protect ourselves from harm, from getting hurt, from being abandoned. But true love risks everything. To a certain degree, true love is reckless. C.S. Lewis captured the heart of authentic relationships, of real love, when he said the following, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal because they'll pass away, they'll die. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and with luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will be unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. It won't be love. Right now, how would you describe most of the friendships that you have? Would you say that many of your friendships are one-dimensional friendships, or are they deeper? Jesus had an authentic, multi-dimensional relationship in mind. He had that with everyone he encountered. Think about it. Jesus befriended the Pharisees, the strict religious people of his day. He befriended also those who were considered the sinners, the outcasts, those who were despised, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the losers, we might say. He befriended all of them. He had love that was genuine for each of them. He befriended all of them, and he gave grace to those who were far from him. He even offers you his friendship. He offers it to you right now. No matter how bad you have been or how good you think you are, Jesus offers you his love freely. You, however, must receive that love. We must take that love into our hearts. We need to recognize that we don't deserve it, regardless of how highly we may think of ourselves. The truth is, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, we are enemies of God. And yet, God offers his sacrificial love to us, his agape love. The scripture tells us that God is love, that love comes from his very nature. That means that the only way to truly understand love is to understand God, at least to a degree. Relationship was his idea. He created it. It flows out of the relationship and the love that he has as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he is the one who defines what true love looks like. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 puts it this way. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 
This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's real love. And you see right in the heart of it, it is sacrificial. The word that is used there by John as he's writing and describing God's love is agape. That, that love that is a choice that chooses to sacrifice one's own wants, one's own desires for the good of another. This is what God has done for us. God the Father sacrificed his son Jesus for us. And Jesus chose to willingly give himself up for us. That's agape. That's real love. God's love for us is unconditional. We don't earn it. There's nothing that we could ever do to deserve it. He loves us, in fact, while we are still enemies to him. Look at what it says in Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He goes on in verse 10 to make it even more emphatic. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is the love that we are to reflect as image bearers of God. The one thing that others should see most clearly in you and I is a self-sacrificing love for them. Because that's what God has called us to do. We are called to reflect his love for us to others. Jesus gave us a, a new commandment in John chapter 13 to love one another. The love required uh, is a reflection of God's love. It is not simply friendship or brotherly love. It's not simply sisterly affection. He calls us to agape one another to choose to love one another with a sacrificial love, a love that is costly, a love that is messy. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Here's what he says in John 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Love is incredibly important to God. In this passage, Jesus tells us how much he loves us. So much so he's willing to give everything to lay down his life for us, his friends. He loves us as friends so much he was willing to die for us. He also invites us into his work to join with him in showing others that God is like this, that God is a God who is sacrificial towards them, who loves them unconditionally. And Jesus commands us to love others in the same way that he loves us. Think about it. Jesus loves us knowing everything about us, all of our faults, all of our fears, all of our failures, all of our sin. And it says he chose us, knowing all that about you and about me. He not only chose us, he calls us his friends. And he was willing to prove that friendship by giving his life for us. He now calls us to obey his command to love others in the same way, so that they may discover a relationship with him as well. Secondly, Often the greatest barrier to loving others is the belief that we ourselves are unlovable. Deep down, we often do not 
feel lovable because of shame. The mirror of self shows us our sin, shows us our failures, shows us something that we think doesn't compare well with others. But the work of Jesus Christ was to take away not only our sin, but all of the shame and to restore us into the people that God has created us to be. You have immeasurable worth. And when you truly understand how much God loves you and the price that he placed upon your life, you're set free to love others sacrificially as well. God's word tells us that Jesus nailed our sins to the cross, that they are gone. Here's what it says in Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This means that legally the guilt is gone, but often in reality or in practice, we feel like the shame remains. It stains our souls and causes us to attempt to cover over our shame by making ourselves look or appear better than we are by posting the best version of ourselves online. The truth is, in Jesus, our judgment day has moved from the future to the past. All of your sin has already been nailed to the cross when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And with that, he takes away the shame. When we were made worthy in Jesus Christ, we lose our need to validate ourselves with money, with physical attraction, with intelligence, with social connections, with fame, or any other thing that may falsely try to build up our life or our reputation. Jesus calls those who believe in him his friends, and he has called us to show his friendship to others, not to impress them with how great we are, but to share with them how much he loves them. That's the beauty of our mission, of our call. And it's not just something that some believers do. It is something he commands of everyone who places their trust in him. Jesus commands us to love others. We are to love them sacrificially as Christ has loved us. In order for us to really understand this, to really understand how we're called to love, we need to go to God's word and listen to what Jesus says to us. There's a passage that's particularly difficult for us to obey where Jesus commands us to not only love the people we like, but to love our enemy, to love those who are not like us, to love those who disagree with us. Let's go to the scripture and let's look in Matthew chapter 5 at what Jesus teaches us about loving our enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What a powerful passage. This command is not possible through human effort. Loving our enemies as God has loved us is a divine act. It requires His Holy Spirit working in us and through us. I want you to think about that person or maybe a group of people that right now you do not like. You would consider them, if you're dead honest, your enemy. You may not like what they stand for, their beliefs. You may see 
what they believe in and what they practice is something that is harmful. The things that they do may threaten the very core of the values that you hold dear. How are we to respond to them? God says to love them, to love our enemies. And in this passage, he shows us exactly, Jesus shows us exactly how you and I are to love our enemies. Remember, love is a choice. It's not an emotion. God is not saying agree with what they do or what they believe in. He is saying love them. He's not saying that you have to feel good about all the things that they stand for. Instead, he's commanding you to reach out, to be sacrificial in the same way that God has reached out to us, the way that he has shown us his mercy and his grace. By the way, mercy is giving someone what they need rather than what they deserve. That's an important thing for us to practice. Grace is giving others that which is good, even though they do not deserve it. God has shown us both mercy and grace, and he calls us to love others and give them mercy and grace as well. How does Jesus teach us to love our enemies, the, the people who disagree with us, who annoy us, who irritate us, who seem to be in opposition against us? How do we love them with a God-like sacrificial love? Well, if you look at the passage backwards, we actually see the steps of how we are to love our enemy. The first thing we need to look like is that we're to commanded to reflect the perfection of God. Did you see that? Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And how did he define his perfection? He defined the display of his perfection is found in loving his enemies. This must be incredibly important to God. If Jesus chooses this moment to call us to perfection, we are to reflect the perfect love of God in our love for others, including our enemies. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Then if we back up a little bit more, we'll see that the first step is to greet them. If we look at the passage backwards, it simply says to greet others. Don't just greet your own people. He says this in verse 47. If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? What Jesus says here is to treat your enemy with kindness, to take an interest in them and in their lives in the same way that you take an interest in the lives of your friends. We're to reach out to them and greet them, to be kind and tenderhearted towards them. The next thing that we see is how God loves us. He not only greets us, he not only reaches off out to us, which means God takes the first move. He takes the initiative. And that's what you and I are to do as well. The second thing that we see is that God meets our practical needs. We are to do the same thing. Look at what he, Jesus says in verse 45. He says that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Because we are children of God, we need to treat those who disagree with us, those who are our enemies, in the same way that God does. God loves them. He provides for them, even though they may never recognize him. He meets their practical needs. We are to look for practical ways to show God's love to others. So the next step is not only to greet them, not only to take the initiative and to reach out, but to look to see if there are needs in their life that you could help meet. There's a powerful movie it's on Netflix right now, entitled Best of Enemies. It's a story of a civil rights activist named Ann Atwater and the local head of the Ku Klux Klan. His name is C.P. Ellis. It's a true story. Ann is black and C.P. is not only white, he's a white supremacist. But in that story, best of enemies, we see portrayed exactly what Jesus is talking about. Because as you watch through the story, you see that the turning point in the relationship came 
when Anne, who is a strong believer in Jesus Christ, reflected God's love by meeting a deep need that CP had. CP had a son with special needs, and Anne went out of her way to help meet the needs of this boy in a very loving and practical way, even though she didn't like CP and didn't agree with him about almost anything. She was compelled by the love of God to reach out and serve CP's son. Seeing God's love expressed through his enemy began to change CP. I won't give away the story, but it's exactly what Jesus is teaching us here. We are to reflect the love of God in practical ways. Here's a question. How could you serve the need of that person who is so difficult for you to like? Ask the Lord to show you a practical step that you could take and then be brave enough, have faith in God enough to do it. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil but overcome evil with good. To reflect the perfect self-sacrificing love of God, we are to love our enemies. We are to greet them, take an interest in them, make the first move, and then we're to seek to meet practical needs in their life as God meets our own. But next, if we back up farther in the passage, we're told to pray for them. Verse 44, but I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Do you see how that point is the center pin of this whole passage? If we're to reflect the love of God, if we're to be image bearers of God, if we're to look like Jesus to the world around us, we must love our enemies. We must pray for them. Jesus commands us to love them and to intentionally pray for them. We're to pray for our enemies, and it's a beautiful reflection of God's perfect love because he sends the Holy Spirit to prompt us, to draw us to himself. Jesus did this exact same thing on the cross. He prayed for the very people who were crucifying him. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus is commanding us to do what he has already done in loving his enemies in such a way and praying for the people who hurt us or persecute us so that they might come to know God themselves, so that they might be transformed and we might enter into a relationship with them in the Lord. When we pray for our enemies, we're praying for their good. We are praying for God to bless them, to act in a way that accomplishes the very best in their life. We certainly pray for their salvation. We pray for repentance, but we're praying for their good. This is how we are to love our enemies and to reflect the perfect agape love of God. And here's the truth. This is revolutionary. If we as followers of Jesus really want to see change in our world, in a world that seems to be getting crazier and crazier, this is how we are to do it. We are to practice the reckless, self-sacrificing love of God towards others, even towards those we dislike and disagree with. The conditions of COVID and the separation that it brings presents a challenge, and it also presents an opportunity in loving others. Here in Prague, we can't get together. We're limited to a gathering of two and no more. We can't have meals together. But if we seek the Lord, I believe he will show us creative ways to express God's love to others, both to those within the church, which we need to do to build up one another, and to those that we have conflict with. So let me ask you to be creative. 
this is a time when the church needs to come together. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you in beautiful and unique ways. Let's ask him to show us how to practice love during COVID in practical ways, how to pray for one another, how to encourage each other, how to build one another up, how to show the agape love of God towards others. Now, here's one idea. Uh, one of the things that Becky and I are, are trying to practice right now. We can't get together for meals and we, we can't go out to a restaurant. But what we can do is we can still share meals with others. We can, I'm going to use it, I'm going to make up my own phrase again. We can meal it forward. We can choose to send a meal to someone else that we know. Maybe it's somebody in your building that you live with someone you don't know necessarily very well, or maybe you've even had some conflict with them, encourage them by sending them a meal. Find out what they like and order a meal on Dame Yedlo or Wolt and send it to them. You can do the same thing to people within the church just as a blessing and as an encouragement. We can meal it forward. We can show the love of Christ in a practical way, a tangible way, even during a time of COVID and lockdown. But there are other ways we can do that also. We can encourage and build up those around us. Ask the Lord to show us how to do it. And then would you share those ideas on Facebook, on YouTube, send us an email. Let's be creative. Let's be intentional about showing the love of God, reflecting the love of God during this season. I believe if we do, if we become accurate reflections of God's love to the world around us, we will begin to see transformation happen in the lives of people all around us. Prague will begin to be changed. The world will begin to be changed. The relationships that you have, even those relationships that you have with the people that are difficult for you to like, will be changed. Let's start a great revolution, a revolution of reflecting God's love in such a way that they see an accurate picture of who he truly is. God bless you and have a great love-filled day.